student pensions. And in that role, he led the higher education portfolio, including issues of college affordability, financial aid, eligibility, student debt, and consumer protection. Before joining the HELP Committee, Bryce was a policy analyst for the Association of Community College Trustees and a staff assistant for the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Education and Labor. Stephanie here from Benefit Data Trust um, is responsible for partnerships with institutions of higher education to drive forward the work of benefit access for meeting college students' basic needs. Stephanie brings over 10 years of work directly with students in higher education settings, including several years of work in case management supporting students with basic needs access and reducing barriers to degree completion. In her higher education experience, she's seen firsthand how basic needs and security can undermine a student's progress towards a degree, but also how the right support and access to basic needs support can allow students to realize their academic potential and meet career goals. With that being said, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to our wonderful presenters. Bryce. Thank thanks, away. Jamie. Can you hear me all right? All right, well, I'm gonna um, switch over to a PowerPoint here shortly, but just first wanna say um, it's wonderful to be uh, with mm -hmm. all of you. Um, I am based in Washington State right now after I um, moved out of DC to uh, return to where I grew up, um, help take care of my folks. And um, like Washington is just one of the states across the country like Kentucky that has been um, undertaking a top to bottom analysis of what the state can do to connect students to um, the resources that they need to succeed in college. Because I think what we all agree on um, and why we're here today is that uh, the ability for students to be able to meet their basic needs like food, housing, childcare, transportation, that really are essential to them being a whole person um, are uh, the central conditions from which they can learn their ability to succeed in college. And so this is really a student success conversation as much as it is a basic needs uh, conversation. I think some folks sometimes think of um, the world of, of basic needs support as, as just a feel good exercise that we're just trying to help, help people because it's the right thing. And that may be true, um, but it's really also about the brass tacks, economic development and workforce goals that we have, because if students aren't able to get to graduation day, they're not going to be able to contribute as whole people to our society. Um, so I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, let's see if it'll let me. Uh, yep, looks like it. All right. Uh, let's see, is that working for you all? Okay. Um, so just uh, really my my role here is is scene setting of why we're talking about um, specifically uh, connecting students to um, public and tax benefits um, uh, as one means to help students access um, the, the supports they need to, to meet their basic needs. Um, there's obviously other aspects to basic needs support. You know, if, if college were truly affordable for these students in the first place, they might not have uh, basic needs challenges. So there's obviously conversations around financial aid, um, the amount of funding provided to institutions to be able to to, uh, to lower their costs. But we're we're going to be talking about the the aspects of public benefits um, that can help students succeed. Now, just a brief sort of who am I? What what are we coming to to you with uh, today? I work for the Hope Center at Temple University. Um, the, uh, the brief is that we are a research center uh, that also does policy and, and practice work, um, helping uh, institutions um, and states and systems improve their uh, practices related to basic needs. We uh, call this systems change. Uh, and and uh, what we mean by that is that we're not necessarily solving this, um, you know, just one student at a time. While that is really important, we also need to fight upstream to help uh, improve the ec ecosystem in which our students operate and our colleges can provide the resources to their students. Um, we do, uh, uh, we are, our sort of general uh, philosophy also is very tied to uh, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs that you're all probably familiar with. We're obviously talking about basic needs, um, not just physiological like food, warmth and rest, but also safety and security. Uh, the students need to be able to reach those higher levels of success as humans. Now, there are many aspects to what we consider to be basic needs. It may be different what um, the most urgent questions are on your campus or in your community, 
Um, but we think of this as broad uh, when it comes to, to the, the non-tuition costs that students are facing, um, their overall financial health, but underneath that, I've mentioned food, housing, healthcare, including mental health, um, childcare and other supports for parenting students, transportation to and from campus or to work, um, uh, technology and course supplies, just a few of those. And these particular um, uses or these particular definitions have also uh, made their way into um, an analysis of both um, at the federal level and uh, through our own surveys of institutions of what it is that students are experiencing. Um, this slide here um, is just giving you a few stats from a recent national um, survey that the National Center for Education Statistics conducted. It was the first ever federal survey of student basic needs released just last August. Um, and it found that about uh, one in four undergraduates or 23% of students are experiencing food insecurity, which is defined as low or very low food security. Those are um, very uh, rigorously tested um, uh, statistics using a very commonly accepted definition around food security is an 18 point survey um, according to USDA standards. Um, and this translates to uh, more than 4 million students across the country experiencing basic needs, uh, experiencing food insecurity, um, combined undergrad and graduate students. That rate of nearly one in four students experiencing um, food insecurity is double what we know about all other U.S. households. So 23% um, versus the food security rate uh, of ha U.S. households, which is 10.5% according to the analysis of USDA. So we have a very real and urgent problem on our institutions of higher education and I know you all know that um, since you're here today, but just worth restating why, why it is what we are talking about, what we're talking about. The Hope Center also surveys our students. Um, uh, this is a more of a selective uh, uh, participant. The latest data we published was from 2020, and that found that three in five students were experiencing some form of foundational basic need security, whether it be food, um, in, uh, housing insecurity, or even um, uh, experiencing homelessness, another form of housing insecurity. So one of these three main categories um, all rolled up to at least one in uh, three out of five students saying that they experienced one form of this. And I know many of you have uh, surveyed your students and uh, Kentucky's talking about statewide approaches as well. Now, of those students who are experiencing those challenges, I just want to uh, say why it is we're, we're thinking about um, a public and tax benefits, which I'm uh, personally passionate about, as one means to address this particular problem that we're seeing in the data. And the reason is that the uptake is extremely low. Um, of the students who in our survey said that they were experiencing basic needs and security, um, uh, one of those three foundational elements of basic needs and security, less than one in five, or 18% said that they were receiving SNAP, a Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, formerly known as food stamps. Now, the reason why that is so low is that we see much higher rates of uptake in food insecure households who are not students. So we might wonder why that is. Is it complexity? Is it the, they don't know how to access it? Is it their life is busy? Is it stigma? There are a lot of reasons why students might not uh, be able to access those supports. So we need to dive a little bit uh, deeper to figure out what's going on here. Now, the latest data from the Hope Center survey that I was talking to you about um, dives a little bit into some of the reasons or the, the what's below that uptake number, um, which I'll show on the next slide. But just briefly here, these are three different categories of kinds of supports that students might want to access if they were experiencing basic needs and security. And what you see here is on the further leftmost two bars here, um, disaggregated by two and four year institutions, that again, just about less than one in four students uh, were using any form of SNAP to support their uh, the, support them. And these are of students who said that they were uh, experiencing basic needs and security. And then the rates are just almost zero when it comes to uh, people who have accessed help finding affordable housing or emergency housing supports. We have other data on other benefits. It's similarly depressing. Um, we see just very, very low rates of people being able to access these supports. 
And I've seen a lot of state level surveys across the country that have shown pretty similar results that just the people who are struggling are not getting the help that they need. When asked why that is, why when they were experiencing basic needs and security, did they not access the supports that might be available to them? The overwhelming response was, I don't think I'm eligible. Now, that may not be, that may be the case. There obviously are people who are not eligible for benefits, but we know there are a huge number of students who could be active in supports who aren't. And this is really the call for action when we look at the data is that there is complexity here um, that people don't necessarily know. We also see 52% of these students saying they just didn't know how to apply. Um, they didn't know they would existed. Now, some people might want to blame the student. They might want to say, well, those things are available and they just didn't, they did just chose not to. You'll actually see that those sort of stigma related concerns um, I'm embarrassed to apply for these benefits or people like me don't use those actually come in as the the very small minority of the, the recipients or excuse me of the respondents who say why it is they didn't access so only about 19% say it's people like me don't use that 26% um, uh, now those are not zero those are certainly real challenges and we do have to confront stigma but simply saying well the student didn't access it um, because and they, they they didn't, you know, that was their choice is actually not accurate. We have a job to do when it comes to providing information to students and connecting them directly with the benefits. In their own voice, students respond to our survey. They say things like, it's very confusing to get through the applications, or I just don't have the knowledge. This is a very complicated thing. Um, we also see scarcity concerns that maybe maybe they do need it, but they're worried that that takes away from something else, that someone else is not going to get the benefit when we know that the public benefits that we have don't quite work like that. So again, these are some real challenges that we have in terms of being able to uh, support our students. Now, just to, as I set up the, the stage here for Stephanie to, to talk about how we might be able to use FAFSA data help to, to link students with benefits, how we might be able to use it. I just wanted to sort of put on the map that the current FAFSA, the one that, that students are belatedly filling out now for the, for the upcoming school year, um, uh, contains a lot of questions about the receipt of federal benefits. Um, asks about uh, not just SNAP, but the earned income housing tax credit, free and reduced price lunch, Medicaid, um, health care subsidies for uh, uh, assisting with the uh, purses of insurance, um, SSI, TANF, um, and WIC. So the map is huge here. I think we often mostly just talk about SNAP because it's sort of the big, uh, big benefit, but these are really important scale of benefits. There's a wide range that we can think about how we connect students to. And uh, there are some examples of states that have done this. Institutions can also obviously do it. That's what we're talking about here today. Um, but we have some examples of states that have proactively decided to send out students who might be eligible uh, information about SNAP. Unfortunately, um, I only have examples related to SNAP, not other uh, statewide outreach. Um, California has tested uh, different means of uh, sending out emails and postcards um, and seeing that they actually have uh, some differences in the, uh, when they're able to reach students repeatedly. Massachusetts has also done some, some of this. Um, realizing these are uh, uh, blue states, um, uh, but have these folks have simply, you know, sort of taken the lead here. And we're seeing across the country, red and blue, um, you know, other states with, you know, purple states who are who realize that this is essentially a student success question and are actively uh, working to help their students access benefits. So with that, hopefully I've set the stage of why this is important. Um, I'm so grateful to Jamie and the Kentucky Success Collaborative for talking about basic needs in the context of public benefits and the ways that we can help students reach, reach their supports. Um, uh, just here, we do have a, a newsletter. We also have uh, some direct uh, assistance for their institutions. You can also just email me um, rather than using a complicated uh, QR code. Um, and I'll be here for the, for the Q&A as well to talk about um, some of the reasons why we do this work and uh, what other ways we can um, can help uh, connect students through state and federal outreach as well. Uh, so, uh, Jamie, either I'll turn it back to you or directly to Stephanie. Hey, Bryce. 
Stephanie, we're going to hand it off to you so you can talk about um, all the great things that Benefits Data Trust has in terms of your all's toolkit and other resources yeah. for folks. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm going to just take a second to share my screen. Okay. Can you all see that okay? Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm going to start with a little bit of, uh, of background on college students and public benefits. I think Bryce set the stage for that really well, but just to give you a, a few stats and, and things that that's on our mind at, at Benefits Data Trust and how we think about this work. And then um, talk a bit about the why of using FAFSA data to connect students with benefits and give you a quick overview of our toolkit, which is publicly available, free. Um, I'm gonna ask actually my colleague, Daniel, who's on the call, if you could drop in the link to the toolkit. Um, I'm gonna give you an overview today, but I, I really hope you spend some, some more time on it and check it out and use it where it can be useful for you. Um, so just quickly about Benefits Data Trust, we're a national nonprofit. We use data, technology, and policy to, um, to work towards efficient and dignified access to public benefits to improve people's health and financial security. The reason we do this work is that there's more than $80 billion annually in government benefit programs that goes untapped. So here we know, you know, Bryce really set the stage well for the, the basic needs crisis that's happening for many students across the country. And here we have all of these programs that are that are often untapped, but could be helping people meet their basic needs. And to give just a little more student perspective on this, we estimate an annual um, amount of three billion dollars in SNAP that's going un untapped by eligible college students, which is about two million students out of three point three million eligible that are that are not participating in the program. So this is really the problem that we're trying to solve, along with access to other benefits as well. Um, it's just a little more concrete data on SNAP and students sometimes. And then to give a little bit of a, of a visual on this, um, this graphic is our estimates for um, SNAP, Medicaid, um, WIC, and the child tax credit. So this is just to kind of help you think about the value of public benefits for students in, in terms of how much money it can help them um, towards meeting their basic needs. So on the left here, you'll see an example of a single student who's getting a maximum Pell Grant that could be tapped into an additional $8,000 a year from um, SNAP and Medicaid access. And on the right here, you'll see an example of a student with a child who also has a maximum Pell Grant and could be tapping into SNAP and Medicaid, as well as um, WIC and the child tax credit, as well as the children's health insurance program for their child to get an additional $14,000 a year towards meeting their basic needs or meeting their family's basic needs. Um, and so just to talk briefly for a moment about why, why we should be using FAFSA data to connect students with benefits. Um, it helps focus resources on likely eligible or specific at-risk populations and enables us to do equitable outreach to reach underserved students. And um, it also allows us to tailor outreach schedules based on expected capacity. So one of the things um, that comes up often in my work with partner institutions is like we want to do some targeted outreach to the folks we think would be eligible for SNAP or other benefits on our campus, but we have limited resources to funnel students to to actually be able to help them through those applications. Um, and so one thing that we talk about is tailoring outreach schedules and helping folks reach out to the students who are proactively, who are likely in need and sort of tailor that based on your expected capacity at different times of the year. Um, and then finally, for any folks who might be unfamiliar, I just wanna point to the January, 2022 Dear Colleague letter that the Department of Ed issued reminding institutions that FAFSA data can be used to, um, to help in administering several federal benefit programs. Um, I'm going to talk a little more about our toolkit and give you that overview in a second, but just in the, in the spirit of why we talk about this, like data-driven outreach or outreach to likely eligible students based on FAFSA data, um, I'll share that we did a, an um, a pilot of our toolkit with four Maryland community colleges in the 22 to 23 academic year. And what we saw, um, there was different strategies across the campuses in terms of who they actually reached out to about public benefits. What we saw was the institution that used our toolkit, used data versus reaching out to everybody on their campus. 
it was it was twice as effective as getting benefit applications mm -hmm. submitted. So really what we're talking about here is, is channeling resources to the students who are most likely to be eligible. They had double the rate of benefit applications just by reaching out um, to a targeted population. In this pilot, we, um, BDT has a contact center in Maryland where we screen and apply individuals for multiple public benefits. So we were able to, we had a designated phone line for each school. So we were able to track the applications we submitted on behalf of students at the school. And basically we talked to more of the right, more of the right people who were likely to be eligible for SNAP and other benefits by targeting our outreach to folks that we had some kind of indicator they could be eligible. And then to give you a quick overview of our toolkit right now. Um, if you go to our website and check it out, you'll see it has a pretty specific focus on leveraging data to find students who are eligible. Coming this June, we'll be updating that to include a section on crafting effective benefits outreach. So that will include some tips on incorporating behavioral science principles to um, increase effectiveness of outreach, as mm -hmm. well as some sample language that you're welcome okay. to draw yeah. from to think about, um, about implementing your own benefits you campaigns. Yeah. Is there someone is chatting and I'm hoping you could go on mute just because I get distracted a little too easily and I don't want to say the wrong things. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then um, finally, I'll just preview that in our future, we'll be working on, uh, we'll be working towards and releasing a data sharing toolkit. And the ultimate goal for us is to help benefit administering agencies at the county or state level, coordinate with higher education institutions to share data in ways that streamline student access to public benefits. Um, if you go to, oh, sorry, I'm one slide ahead of myself. Never mind, I'll talk about this first. Um, so in our current toolkit, we help assess likely eligibility for the four benefits that you see on the screen. I'll just kind of do a quick overview of each in case, in case anyone's familiar with any of them. Um, the first one that we cover is SNAP. This is a national average that it provides around $180 a month per household member. So again, if a student's in a, in a household of more than one, it could be a higher dollar value than that um, via an EBT, EBT card that they can use to purchase groceries. Um, it helps assess likely eligibility for Medicaid as well as the child tax credit, which provides up to $2,000 per year per child with 1,500 of that amount being refundable, meaning that when a, student, a parenting student files their taxes, that's $1,500 back in their pocket to help them pay for basic needs. And then finally, um, WIC, which provides an average value of supplemental foods for $56 a month plus nutrition education, formula and breastfeeding support. Um, I will quickly add that on our website, you'll see our toolkit also helps institutions identify students who are likely eligible for the Affordable Connectivity Program, which provides discounted broadband assistance, or should I say provided, past tense. Um, that program is no longer taking enrollments, but um, we're sort of prepped to help institutions do that kind of outreach as well if Congress provides additional funding and if that program continues, which is still unfortunately TBD. Um, so if you take a look at our website, this is this is what you'll see for the basic structure of the toolkit. We've kind of divided it into three sections. As I mentioned, there's going to be a fourth section very soon on effective outreach. Um, the first section is, is called Start Strong. It's really the foundational stuff where you would kind of take a look at what your institution's already doing, set some goals around benefits outreach, um, build your team, make sure you're involving the right stakeholders on campus, the people who can pull the right data, the people who can craft outreach, the basic needs teams that can support students or might have partnerships with nonprofits that support students and kind of coordinate among those groups. And then the middle section, which we've called prepare data, I'm going to give you like a quick snippet on the next slides of, of two of those tools, but that's really the, the meat of the toolkit where we walk you through what, what data is there where you can assess what's available to you on your campus to do some targeted outreach. And then um, and then how, how does that prepare you to do outreach, excuse me, on, um, on each of the benefits covered in the toolkit. And then finally, there's a section on action planning and evaluating. Um, one thing I will also name here is that uh, you've probably heard of a little thing called the new FAFSA this year, been a little bit of a chaotic financial aid year. If you look at our toolkit today, it would help you do outreach to students who filed the 23-24 FAFSA, as well as some 
some non-financial aid related data. We will be updating it in June to reflect the, the FAFSA moving forward, the 2024 um, academic year and beyond. So keep, keep an eye on that if that's something you're interested in doing in the next academic year. Um, to just briefly talk about the, the methodology about how we came up with these data elements, um, many people might know that students um, in terms of SNAP have to first meet a SNAP student exemption in addition to sort of the normal income and assets and regular eligibility criteria that the general public has to meet. So what we did to, um, to start working on our toolkit was we looked at some direct um, and indirect indicators of benefits eligibility, our benefits process team compared the compared the FAFSA to the SNAP student exemptions to take a look at what institutions may already what data institutions already have that indicate yes the student meets a SNAP student exemption or this student maybe you don't have the data to know for sure but this very, student very likely meets a SNAP student exemption so for example there's a few SNAP student exemptions around having dependents of different ages and having childcare or not having childcare you may not know all of those pieces of data but it's a pretty good proxy if a student reported dependents or children on their FAFSA to know that they they might meet one of those student exemptions so in addition to looking at those direct and indirect indicators that correlate with benefits eligibility, um, or I should say another indirect indicator was we looked at risk factors for basic needs and security and common programs across campuses that address those basic needs. So there's also plenty of space to look at data that you might have access to, for instance, if your institution tracks who uses the food pantry. Maybe a student didn't file a FAFSA, but is food insecure and is using the food pantry. So as, as much as I know today, we're talking about using FAFSA data, I'll also just point to there are things beyond FAFSA data to, to think about using in benefits outreach. Um, and then as I mentioned, I'm just gonna quickly preview a couple of tools in the toolkit. Um, happy to take any questions later as well. Um, our tool four, which we've called Explore Available Data, has um, it's, it's basically where you can kind of map out on a worksheet what data is available to me and what's not available to me to think about using that data for benefits outreach. Um, what I always tell institutions is uh, not having access to one of the data elements on this list should not prevent you from doing benefits outreach. We don't expect this to look the same across all campuses. So it's really about figuring out what's available to you and working with that. Um, so you'll see here the first several items, having dependents or children, being former or current foster youth, um, indicating household receipt of benefits, which Bryce talked about a bit, Pell eligibility or all, you know, all financial aid related data. And then you'll see there's also other things that we suggest institutions walk through, like if you collect data on your food pantry or have a meal swipe donation program, have an emergency aid program, there's lots of other data points to consider in terms of, of who might um, who might be basic needs and secure and who might benefit, benefit, I should use a different word in this context, who might be reasonable to reach out to um, to connect with public benefit applications. Um, and then you'll also see we include a space for brainstorming institution specific data points. So if your institution has grant funded or workforce programs that are targeted to, to help low income workers get into a certain occupation, that might be a good data point to consider. If you have textbook or transportation subsidies, um, it's just kind of a, there's kind of space to brainstorm what is, what's relevant as your institution. And then after you go through this, like just brainstorming for each data element, who, who owns it? Where is it stored? Who can help you pull it? Can you get access to it or not? The, the next step in the, the way our toolkit walks you through it is choosing what benefits you are going to outreach to students about. Um, so just to kind of preview what that tool looks like for each of the benefits we cover in the toolkit, there's a line that looks like this that gives you the benefit name, what it provides, who could be eligible, and then what data we recommend from tool four that I just walked you through that might be useful to creating an, an outreach list of students to drive those students to specific resources to apply for that benefit. Um, so I have SNAP on the screen here. I couldn't I couldn't neatly fit all, all four of the ones we covered. It would be too tiny to read, but if you download that tool, you'll be able to see how it does that for each tool in our toolkit.
Um, and with that, I can hand it back to Jamie. I don't know. I don't know how much the other agenda is or how much time there's for questions. I'm happy to stick around and um, answer any questions that I can. Absolutely. We um, have about 15 minutes for questions. And so I'll go ahead and open it up. Um, let's see. Oh, I think that I see now Bryce answered that in the chat. So I knew there was one up ahead, but feel free to just unmute yourself and come off mute or put in the chat box. I'll be monitoring that if you have any questions. Jamie, if I could, maybe I'll just provide a voiceover to the to the question about um, the SNAP student rule. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we get this question a lot, and I'm so grateful for, Stephanie, your presentation, sort of breaking down these really complicated topics and some of the eligibility categories that are extremely obtuse um, for, for SNAP in particular. Um, it's really a, a sort of a, a, both, a both and question, right? We have um, uh, real barriers in both the federal rules around SNAP that we are simultaneously working to uh, to address in the farm bill reauthorization that will be occurring this year, um, and uh, somewhat in the state's interpretation of those rules, so a sort of larger complexity question, and certainly a lot of students who um, probably do meet even those restrictive rules who just don't know that they're eligible. So we really have to kind of, um, you know, walk and chew gum at the same time with these, but it is Certainly the case, as, as anybody who has done this work will, you know, quickly realizes and uh, the toolkit makes clear that, that there are, you know, uh, si a significant number of, of barriers that have been put in place to students in the, in the SNAP program in particular. Um, and, you know, those were really short-sighted, you know, they're not to get, get too sort of advocacy driven in, in this, uh, in this um, uh, webinar, but, you know, they're, uh, I think a lot of folks thought, well, students in higher education just don't need these benefits. You know, they must have uh, food on campus. They must have a meal plan. They must be living in a dorm. And of course, we know that's just a fraction of the, the students who exist today. And so there's a larger fight ahead on those rules. Um, but I just really appreciate everybody who's, um, you know, pushing forward with what we have while also fighting for a, a, a sort of a more flexible program going forward. And if I could just kind of plus one to what Bryce is saying with all of those, all of those complexities, totally agree. I would also add, I'm I'm trying to dig up the link now and I can share it in the chat. We did a an evaluation project with two community colleges in Pennsylvania and surveyed them around barriers and facilitators to SNAP access. And just just kind of plus one how Bryce has talked about this. What we what we saw. I can't remember the number off my head, which is why I'm trying to dig up this report while I talk. But the vast majority of students, when we ask them the question, um, if you you know if you haven't applied for SNAP, why haven't you applied for SNAP? The vast majority of them said they didn't know about it or didn't know that they could be eligible. Um, still, some stuff some stuff around embarrassment and and that sort of you know getting at the stigma pieces. But but the the students who answered the questions that way it was actually a, a much much smaller fraction and the oh thank you Daniel for linking that in the chat um, the vast majority of them um, did, just were not were not very aware of SNAP and so to me I think that does speak to the power of doing some work to just outreach to students and tell them hey we think you could be eligible for SNAP. Stephanie, I just read through the report this morning for something else and I think the number is thirty eight percent of individuals who responded um, just weren't aware. Thank you. Yeah, it was and 35% said I don't I don't know about it. And 45% said I don't know if I'm eligible. So yeah, I think all the stuff that Bryce mentioned about policy work to be done to make the program more accessible to students. And I think there are students who already could qualify that just are not are not aware or not being served in that area. That's really good information. Thank you all. Um, anyone else? What is this making you all think um, in terms of the work that you all are doing and in proximity to? Um, yeah, curious to hear your all's thoughts.
Well, I have a question around, um, Stephanie, when you all are using this tool with other campuses, um, what, who are the type of stakeholders that are usually using this tool effectively? What does that look like? And um, we'll, we'll start there. I have another question. Yeah. I mean, it's it's definitely a mix. Like, as you can imagine, at different institutions, it, it might be a different office that pulls data or coordinates an outreach campaign like this. I would say m- much of the time we're working with Um, with student affairs folks to coordinate the outreach for folks who are actually pulling the data and figuring out who who are the students likely eligible on our campus. Um, It's been a mix of financial aid folks. Sometimes it's institutional research. Sometimes student affairs folks have access to the data themselves. It, it It really depends on the campus context. Okay, that's helpful. Thank you. And I know um, there's like a variety of subsets of groups on this call and one of the groups on here are some of our connectors with the partnership that we have um, with DCBS and um, KCTCS, which Shauna is at the system level and asked that really great question of Bryce. And so I'm automatically thinking like, how can this toolkit be useful for maybe even our points of contacts, our managers of connectors that are on here? Like, could you give us some guidance on helping us make a connection on how this may be useful for future work. Mm -hmm. Could you say, sorry, could you say just a few words about the role of the connectors? I I might have missed that. Absolutely. Kelly, do you want to, do you want to jump in here and give a little overview? I thought you were coming for me. (laughs) (laughs) So the connectors are um, uh, commissioned by the the Kentucky Health Benefit Exchange Program through the state to offer uh, Medicaid and qualified health plan uh, insurance enrollments. They also have the ability to do SNAP and CCAP applications on their, uh, on the, on the campuses as well. So, um, full variety of, of, of services that we can help them with. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, We have the 16 campuses. So we have, um, a coordinator on each one of the college uh, at each one of the 16 colleges. Amazing. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, to answer the question, I would be thinking about for the connectors, um, I, I would be thinking about who they could coordinate with at the institutional level to make sure outreach gets to the right students to come and see them for that kind of benefit application help. Um, I don't know the the context across the 16 campuses, but often I think often colleges are providing those kinds of services in a um, understandably in a reactive way and like meeting the needs of referrals that get to their office and serving often a high volume of students in that sort of referral based way. I would be thinking about planning like who who can access the data, who can help us do proactive outreach to those students who might otherwise not get to us and could be missing out on support when we just don't know that they need support. They don't know that we're here to provide that kind of support or what we can offer to them um, and, and be identifying timelines during the academic year where they might be able to coordinate and send that outreach and, and get folks referred to the connectors. That's great, thank you. Any other questions? Hi, Jamie. I have a question. Give everybody. Okay. Um, My question is is that we're working on a a coordinated effort um, here at Bellarmine for our summer. We want to try to um, send some communication out with our students this summer. Um, And so I'm looking through the toolkit and I haven't got through it all, but are running into some challenges because we're not uh, able to use. Um, Pell eligibility as an yep. identifier. And so in looking at the Dear Colleague letter as well, it's talking about maybe asking for a prior consent or permission for, for students if we wanted to use that. And so um, just really thinking through how can we um, how can we use FAFSA data without without using the, kind of that Pell eligibility piece because of privacy issues and just wondering how if other colleges are are working through that. Um, We came up with some income bands last year that I thought really worked pretty good because it wasn't exactly all pale. It was kind of just like under $10,000, but with everything changing about FAFSA, that SAI just doesn't work exactly the same way uh, as an EFC did. So just wondering, um, how do I identify students if we're not able to use pale? Yeah. 
Yeah, we're still we're working on our analysis of Pell eligibility and SAI to figure out what we're going to put in our updated toolkit, because um, I think that it's possible Pell eligibility may end up being um, being too broad to be the indicator that that someone could qualify for benefits. So I I would say keep an eye on that, and I hope it can be useful to you. Um, but I think you're also getting at concerns about data sharing across departments on campus. Um, I'm curious if other other folks have have insights on how they've navigated similar issues on their campus. I've seen all kinds of stuff. I've seen folks take a really cautious route where they feel that it, it can't be shared outside of financial aid, but it's okay to have the outreach come from the financial aid office. I've seen folks have an interpretation that as long as financial aid isn't sharing the specifics of why a student is on an outreach list, if they're just sharing back directory information with another office. So for example, if me as the financial aid director, I pull a list of who's got Pell, who has children or dependents, who reported receipt of other benefits on their FAFSA, but I take that piece off and I just give you the list of students to outreach from another department that that's okay. It's definitely, it's we are definitely hearing campuses kind of work through that and have different interpretations. Um, I would really love to see the Department of Ed issue a follow-up to that 2022 Dear Colleague letter that addresses that we're, we're now in sort of a new FAFSA circumstance. Um, but yeah, I, I would say from the most cautious interpretations I've heard, it could still be an option to have that outreach sent from a financial aid office. Bryce, I see you got your hand up, wanna jump in here? Yeah, I just want to add. So thank thank you so much for the question, Leslie. And and I think you know while while we're we've covered the the why and a little bit of the how, there is um, still these larger questions of well, what kind of barriers is the Department of Education going to throw in our way for doing this work? I just want to add as somebody who you know focuses on federal policy almost all day every day that this is front of mind for both me and um, a couple dozen other organizations trying to get that clarity. I was just talking with Stephanie, one of Stephanie's colleagues at, at BDT just yesterday about this. Um, uh, in a previous role, um, uh, I uh, was a staff author of the FAFSA Simplification Act, but I can say one, we never admit, envisioned that it would be this messy, um, that the implementation would be this hard and, uh, and that it would be sort of poorly implemented. And it's caused a whole bunch of areas of sort of vagueness in policy while the department sort of handles these bigger fires at play with the FAFSA. Um, but the updated guidance that Stephanie said that, that they're hoping to get from the Department of Education, we're really hopeful to see that soon, which will clarify the rules around when can you use Pell, when could you use the student aid index, under what conditions, when do you need the student's prior consent, et cetera. And we, we're hoping that we have a very flexible interpretation of those rules. If it isn't flexible, um, then we'll be starting to look at the solutions to that, you know, whether it mean, means needing to get some clarification from Congress or having to revise those rules. So, um, you know, whatever comes down is not final, uh, but we are waiting for that additional clarity. And so it might mean that we have to use these proxies uh, for need um, as it as it so speaks while uh, while we sort of work for other work through other challenges. Um, so I just want to let you know that that you know that that we were we were going to be focused on this and um, trying to work with uh, with others to try to make sure that the um, interpretation comes down as flexible as possible. Because really, there shouldn't be any reason we can't use um, you know Pell status as an indicator just to send an email, and no one's going to be you know have their data disclosed to some third party simply because they got an email from their school saying they might be eligible for benefits. So it's a common sense thing. We're working to fix it. Thank you both. Thank you all. Just want to make sure um, there was a great suggestion from Lily that I want to voice over um, saying that perhaps uh, an, an approach could be the targeted outreach from the financial aid offices, and then that they could direct them to the campus connector for direct support applying. So wanna make sure that is uplifted here as a solution. Any other questions before I have some announcements to share and just wrap us up? I like that suggestion, Jamie. 
what would that look like? Like a verbal communication or a, would it be more of a report that's sent? If we, I just don't want to get into the, to the, you know, breaking rules area of sharing information. So what would be that communication? I wonder what all would be the next question I would have as it pertains to the financial aid office and the connectors. I mean, I think that that could be um, the relationship building. I think a lot of the financial aid offices might not know the connector point of contact on campus. And even our universities have at least two days a month, a connector who can come and provide some targeted support to students on campuses. So um, I would just imagine that maybe out the gate, if it's just a, a really short targeted outreach oh, email to, el to potentially eligible students, there's just the here's who the connector is. And even if there's a Calendly or some kind of link to set up a time to meet with them, that would be one way to just get the ball rolling. You know, I think ultimately we would love to talk more about the, the opportunity with DCBS and the KCTCS MOU. And like, is there an opportunity to connect some of these dots in a more direct way for our connectors, especially the ones on our KCTCS campuses? Um, we'll get there. I think, you know, it's just, we're, we got to try some other things first, you know, and see sure. what work with what we have at our disposal right now. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ellie. Mm -hmm. Shauna, did you have something? Uh, yes, I, I would just add from a KCTCS perspective, the way that that conversation should, could and should currently begin is the connector working with their KCTCS point of contact campus lead, having this, and, and a number of those folks uh, I've noticed are, are in this meeting. Um, so, so the conversation needs to begin there and their campus lead can then work with their chief student affairs officer uh, and have conversations around what they may be willing to ask that particular college financial aid office um, to, to do in the way of outreach. Bryce. Uh, just one last, you know, point of personal privilege here. I, you know, we we work with financial aid administrators all the time, and I really value the work that they do, particularly right now in the um, in the midst of FAFSA implementation challenges. I don't know if there are any financial aid administrators in the house, but thank you for for what you do in the with poor resources. At the same time, given all that is facing them, they may be inclined to say, "Oh, public benefits outreach. That sounds good. Don't bother me with that right now." Uh, or I'm going to be very compliance driven because I'm so worried about the rules around data and so forth. And it's, it can be a bit of an, you know, an ostrich mentality. No blame here. I understand why that is. Um, but it, it may require a bit of pushing, nudging, you know, um, uh, uh, with the financial aid office to make make this a priority with them. And, and I, you know, I say the same thing to our national financial aid friends, the NASPA folks, um, National Financial Aid Association. Uh, just uh, we see a lot of this and um, our friends at uh, Higher Learning Advocates did a study recently of, uh, you know, which offices had done outreach um, on public benefits. Uh, and it showed that, you know, roughly two thirds of financial aid offices had never done anything and didn't plan to. Um, and so, you know, there is a barrier to overcome there with them. Um, and it's it, it definitely one where building relationships and uh, you know, gentle, understandable, um, uh, uh, you know, sympathetic approaches can really bear a lot of fruit. And I appreciate all of the folks who are engaging with those on their campus. And and Bryce, thank mm -hmm. you for that. Um, right now is not the time to even have that conversation um, with any of our college folks regarding financial aid. The, those folks are drowning right now. And until, until they get aid packaged and out the door, um, don't, don't bother them, basically, is, is the message we're getting. All right. Thank you all so much for engaging. Um, I think that thank you also for your uh, comment, Bryce, around perhaps more dialogue and collaboration with the 
uh, Kentucky Associated, Association of Financial Aid Administrators. Um, so I appreciate all of you all being willing to come and learn and listen. And Stephanie, we look forward to the updates to the toolkit in June, and perhaps we can um, have someone from your all's team come back and um, share some of those updates and figure out how we can continue to use this with our different stakeholders. Um, with that being said, I'm going to share my screen just really quickly for a brief wrap up here. So our next student basic needs community of practice will be in April and um, the registration is already live. It's the same registration link and we're uh, Dr. Lily Massa McKinley will be talking about uh, going over the continuum of, uh, continuum of housing insecurity and We've already had some robust conversations around housing insecurity solutions and best practices, and we're gonna continue that with our next community of practice. And also really want to highlight and advertise that many of you were at our student basic needs convening last fall with Dr. Laura Clark, and um, she will actually be doing in-depth training around trauma-informed care, which will result in a certification and really hope that folks on this call will take advantage of these trainings. Um, we have one for May 13th, 9 to 4 p.m. And then we are also going to be hosting another one June 5th, um, since it's going to be another full day training. And so make sure that you take advantage of that. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me and I'm happy to give you more information. As always, all materials from this meeting will be posted on our impact exchange. Um, please get plugged in. If you haven't yet, we have our Student Basic Needs channel, which um, continuously is updated with all of these great resources like the toolkit from Benefits Data Trust and any uh, best practices that we're seeing, um, including from the Hope Center and other partners. And so make sure that you get plugged in if you are not already. If not, um, thank you all again for coming and thank you again Stephanie and Bryce for coming to share your all's knowledge and wisdom with us. And we look forward to see you all at the next community of practice. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.